always fun to catch up with people who have I have had a connection with back in the day and this guy no different Brian Beck we went to elementary school together and now he's a blogger with the Charlotte Bobcats you can find the blog at tradestreetpost.com Brian joined me to talk about the Bobcats you would think we couldn't talk that long about the worst team in basketball but we did we talked about what the Bobcats need to do to improve plus the overall state of the franchise Brian Beck blogs for tradestreetpost.com and you can hear him on the Sports Buffet podcast Sports Buffet Podcast, a uh, reunion of sorts for me. A guy I went to school with back in the day of uh, elementary school age, Brian Beck. He writes for TradeStreetPost.com, a blog that features uh, Charlotte Bobcats and NBA Talk. And uh, Brian, uh, long time no talk. The NBA playoffs are going on now. First, let's uh, kind of talk about how you got to uh, help out with uh, TradeStreetPost.com. How did that come about? Well, I had... Uh... I was just a member of a kind of a popular Bobcats message board in the uh, in the Charlotte area, uh, and, a, and a couple guys that posted on there uh, went and started a blog. Uh, and uh, I guess from the message board, we were kind of friends on there. They kind of liked my opinion of things, so they asked me to come uh, come help them out on the site. So that's that's how we got started. Talk about how big the uh, you know I think when people hear Charlotte, they obviously think of a, a big ACC following with basketball, but Talk about the uh, popularity of professional basketball in Charlotte. Uh, that's a good question. They got a long way to go, Bob. Uh, uh, it's when uh, the Hornets left town. Uh, it's going on about ten years ago now. Uh, there was sort of a deep-seated, uh, you know, there's a lot of spike toward the NBA, and what happened with losing the Hornets. Uh, when the Bobcats came back, they had a hard time kind of winning the city back, and the team has, uh, you know, quite frankly struggled for most of their existence, only making the playoffs one time. Uh, so it, it, it's still an uphill battle um, for the city. It's uh, definitely college sports, basketball, and football are ahead of them, and, um, and they're really struggling now with the Panthers. After Cam Newton got drafted, he sort of owns the city now, so uh, they're really struggling, and, and with the team going seven or fifty nine this year, it was you know the crowds were uh, weren't really that great coming down the stretch. To be honest, so they've got they've got a lot of work to do. Uh, I know uh, Jordan's doing the right thing, in my opinion, with the rebuilding process. But uh, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of pain, and and until they kind of turn around and start winning some games, uh, it's going to be a tough sell. Yeah, we're going to touch on the NBA playoffs here as well. Uh, but you know, when I look at a uh, box score and read the uh, Charlotte uh, Bobcats uh, box score, you know, there honestly are just a lot of names that people don't recognize. I mean, I can't even remember some of the names that I saw towards the end, but, you know, Kimball Walker, obviously you recognize names like that, but, I mean, Charlotte had a lot of no names uh, kind of starting and playing for them. What is uh, Michael's uh, view and maybe philosophy on the team here going forward? Well, I think they, um, last summer Michael hired uh, Rich Cho um, as a general manager, which most of you probably don't know, but Cho is a, uh, he was the assistant general manager under Sam Presti at Oklahoma City. Uh, so he's sort of familiar with uh, rebuilding through the draft. You know, he was there when they drafted Durant, Nesbrook, Harden, and uh, Baca. Uh, so I think Jordan reached out to him to get some help. He's kind of one of the... Uh, Money ball type general managers. He's, uh, you know, he has a database with all the players in it in the NBA, college, uh, development league. So, you know, I think really the plan is they had, they made the playoffs a few years ago, but were really cap strapped. I mean, they were, we're about to go into luxury tax land with a team that just wasn't very good and just good enough to win half the games. And Jordan decided that. You know, I, I think he decided that he wasn't being fair um, to the city to just put it, you know, put a team out there that could just barely get in the playoffs. And you know, you're a small market in the NBA. Just about the only way to get better um, is to get worse first. So, you know, they traded Joe Wallace um, at the deadline uh, last year. They got two first round picks for him, and then they traded Stephen Jackson before the draft last year. So, like you mentioned, there's, there's a lot of players on this team that most folks 
just aren't familiar with. Um, and to be fair, I would say that they, they've got some you know, talent, but they probably have a lot of role players. Um, they have a lot of six, seven, eight men type players, which, uh, which they might be able to use in the rebuilding process, but you can't, you can't roll five of them out there and compete in the NBA. Um, and, and that's really the biggest, the biggest problem that they've got. There's a, there's a dearth of talent and they just weren't good enough. I don't think it was a, the team laying down or anything like that. Just talent wise, they were worse than just about every team they played. So, uh, it was a long year. And, and like you mentioned, Kimball Walker, uh, is probably the most recognizable name out there. Um, they picked up him and, uh, Bismarck Biombo in the draft last year. Uh, both of them struggled a little bit in the, uh, during the rookie year. Somewhat understandable coming out of a lockout because none of them, uh, none of the rookies got any summer league, uh, work, uh, really didn't even get into training camp until right before the season started. So, it was a long, it was a long year for them. Do you think that people though kind of worry when they hear, you know, I, I don't know how much, uh, Michael is letting uh, Cho do all his, letting Cho run the team and Michael kind of taking hands off because I think, you know, as great of a player as Michael Jordan is, he's also remembered for uh, Kwame Brown when he was in Washington kind of running things. Is Michael really kind of hands off with basketball uh, decisions with this uh, team? I think that's yet to be seen. Um, there's a, you know, there's a lot of people out there and, uh, they, they call him around here Foms, F-O-M's, you know, friends of Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he likes to surround himself with, you know, Rod Higgins and uh, Fred Witt and some guys he's known a long time. Uh, there's, you know, he's been the basketball, he was a uh, head of basketball operations when he was the uh, uh, minority owner. There's a lot of, there's, this team's made a lot of bad moves, and a lot of folks think, you know, he's been behind those. Um, and then he, he bought full ownership about two years ago. And it's, it's going to be seen. I mean, I think the, the first move he made that really uh, at least gave me some confidence was hiring Rich Cho because the Cho is a, a guy that doesn't think like him. He's not an old-school basketball mind. Um, but I think it, we're just going to have to wait and see if he lets Cho do his job. I think that's a real key, um, a key point. And the biggest move that they have to make as an organization uh, this summer is, is hiring the right coach. Um, you know, we've bounced around. It seems like there's a different coach every uh, every other year. And I think Silas did an admirable job with the team he had. Uh, but, you know, it's time to turn the corner. So they, they need to hire the right coach. Uh, and I... You know, hopefully that Jordan has has learned enough on the job. It seems like he's uh, beginning to understand um, that he's got to let go a little bit. But you know, we'll see through the draft and some of the free agent moves. I think I think he's learned um, and is learning because a lot of the moves that the organizations made since last last summer seem like prototypical Rich Cho moves to me. So I think we're just going to have to wait and see it, if he allows himself to be hands off. Well, I think you might uh, know where my next question is going. Uh, what is the right move in terms of a coach? Who's the guy? The, I don't think it's probably realistic that they're going to be able to get a big name. Um, I know a lot of folks local, locally are looking at you know, either one of the Van Gundys, you know, assuming Stan gets fired in uh, Orlando. And people have put it around, you know, Mike D'Antoni and some others, but I think realistically, it's probably going to have to be, you know, a top tier assistant. Right. At fire. Um, and that seemed to work pretty well for most of the other teams up and coming. You know, what Chicago did with Thibodeau, mm -hmm. um, Oklahoma City with Brooks. I think it's finding the right guy. I, I'm not sure who that is. I know they've had a lot of interest. They've interviewed Mike Malone uh, from Golden State. Um, he's the lead assistant there in, in, in New Orleans and Cleveland prior to that. Um, he seems to be a defensive-minded guy, which would be good because the team is pretty porous on defense. What about Patrick uh, Ewing? I'm not real high on Patrick Ewing, and that just kind of goes back to the friends of Mike thing. Right. Uh, you know, I, I think hiring Ewing, you know, wouldn't go that well probably in the city because 
uh, like you said, maybe a lot of folks are in that. Hoping Michael kind of lets go. I'm not sure how good of a coach Ewing would be. I think it would probably be not in his best interest to hire someone he's got a real personal relationship with. Well, and you mentioned it too. I mean, Indiana, I mean, if uh, I think it's uh, Vopel Vogel, if he's not coach of the year, I don't know why not. Because if anybody told me Indiana would be a three seed in the East coming into the year, even with the, watching uh, less NBA basketball than I used to, I would have called you a liar because I didn't think there would be any way Indiana would be a three seed in the East. And, you know, I mean, let's be honest, too. Who was Greg Popovich before he started coaching the Spurs? Not a lot of people really knew him. And if I'm not mistaken, back in the day when he got hired, I think that move was kind of a, an eyebrow raiser to a degree, too. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with both of those. You mentioned the vocals a good name that, that I left out there. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of coaches um, that are out there that, that – know what they're doing, and, and they kind of put their time in. Um, and I think that's probably the, the, the right direction. Um, the, this, team is so, this team is so young. Um, you know, I, there's probably only a few players on this team that are going to be on the roster next year. Uh, they're all been in the league very, very few amount of years, and um, they, the Bobcats really need to hire someone who is going to be patient and as a teacher, because um, there's some talent on the squad, but they need to be developed. And I don't think you can get, uh, you can bring in someone who's who's going to try to be pushing them in right away, not going to be patient and develop this young talent. We'll keep rolling on the Bobcats uh, talk here a little bit. Uh, I think probably the lowest they can go, if I'm not mistaken, with the uh, lottery is they can't fall below three, right? It's actually four. Okay, um, four. They could fall. Go ahead. Yeah, so they, they could fall to four. Um, they have a 25% chance of getting the one seed. Uh, it, it, the uh, Anthony Davis, I guess everyone knows, he's kind of a difference maker in this draft. Uh, most of the scouts have him in kind of a class by himself. And to be honest, if the Bobcats want to turn this around quick, they, they could use to get real lucky. Um the, the good thing about if they fall even through two, three, or four is th this team is so void of talent, um, they're going to get somebody who can help them. Right. Um, the, I would say that the players that we have that are probably in the long term, I mean, we mentioned Kimball Walker and Biombo. Um, Jill and Henderson had a pretty nice year of shooting guard. Um, and Byron Mullins uh, did pretty well coming off the bench at Power 4, too, but there's really nobody on this team that I would say is kind of locked in as a starter at any position. Uh, so I think the Bobcats look for the best available. Uh, we really need to land a starter um, in this draft, whoever we pick. You know, yeah. Hopefully it'll be Anthony Davis, but regardless of who, whoever we get, I think we'll be able to start for us pretty quick. Yeah, what's your take on Anthony Davis? I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think he's the clear-cut number one pick, and it kind of sounds like you're hitting on that a little bit too, but I mean, is this a case of where he is LeBron James to where one to two is a big drop-off, or I mean, are you comfortable with, uh, I guess, who would the who would the four players you would be that you'd be comfortable with that with the Bobcats not being able to fall lower than four? Yeah, I, I think Anthony Davis is kind of like you mentioned. I think that he's been kind of a pure one by himself in this draft class. Uh, I've seen a lot of comparisons out there to um, Garnett or Tim Duncan, and I think those could be accurate. Uh, you never know. The draft is sometimes a crapshoot. But he, he just seems so talented on both ends of the floor. Um, he's still kind of growing into his body. And I think when he was a junior in high school, he was a 6'3 guard. Right. Um, and, he, and he just shot up seven inches in a year. So I, I kind of feel like he's still growing into his body. He's going to get nothing but better. Um, in, in the background of the guard, you can kind of tell he's got he's got a good handle for a guy his size. He shoots well from the perimeter. Um, he's just a monster defensively on the glass. And he's going to have to bulk up a little bit. You know, he, he's in a class of his own. Whoever lands him is going to get a guy they're probably locking in for you know at least a dozen years. Do they um, cater their coach to if they get that one pick? Obviously, it probably becomes Davis. Do they cater their coach then to become a guy that can get? 
develop a big man, or do you still just kind of need to get somebody who can develop uh, everybody? Uh, that's a good question. And I, I think that they're holding off, to be honest. They, they've been interviewing quite a few candidates the past couple of weeks, but I get the impression that they're not in a hurry to hire anybody because they're going to wait and see where the, the ping pong balls bounce in a couple of weeks. Because I think the doors open up and the coach and search if they land one, you know, the number one pick. Right. Uh, there's probably going to be a lot more interest in, the, in that position if they know Anthony Davis is coming on board. And I would lean toward bringing in a guy who's a big guy coach anyway because they have Biombo that they drafted last year who's amazing athlete, great defender, shot blocker, but he's as raw as it gets on the offensive end. And he's still, you know, he, he came from the Congo. He's really still running the game. So uh, they made a big investment probably on interior guys, and bringing in a guy who could coach down I think would be a priority. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I take it you are would not be a great big fan of them bringing a coach in from college. Um, I'm not a big fan of that. It's, uh, there's not a high success rate for that in the NBA. Right. Uh, it's it's just, it's just a different game, you know. Mm-hmm. An NBA an NBA coach, I think, is more of a more of a manager. You're dealing with personalities. Yep. Um, you're managing the game. It's uh, this team's a little different because it's so young. It's close to a college team, so it might work a little better. But you know, you kind of feel like a guy who has some experience in the NBA typically does better than college coaches. Um, so I would probably shy away from that. But it sounds like the Rockets are going to interview a few guys with some college. Uh, I know they interviewed the. Um, uh, I'm, I think the Mike Bullaff, I think the guy who was uh, the assistant at St. John's that filled in for Latin last year. So they are going to talk to a few college guys, but I I kind of doubt they'll lean that way with the hire. And you mentioned uh, getting some uh, picks back in some trades, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, is it only one first round pick this year for the uh, for the Bobcats? <laughs> Yeah, that's correct. They only have one. Um, Do they try to get back in the first round with anything else? You think? I think. I think potentially they can. Um, the, the problem that they have is they they don't have a lot of talent. So the likelihood that they're going to be able to trade a player and get a first round pick is not very high. Um, I think the most likelihood that they get back in um, is that they do have the thirty first pick. Right. Um, the, the, the first pick in the second round which is pretty nice because the difference between 30 and 31 is that the team is drafting at the end of the first round have to give a guy a four-year guaranteed deal. Um, the 31st pick and any other second-round pick is non-guaranteed. Right. So I, I think there's a fair chance that one of those teams, that you know, a championship contender that's in the mid to late 20s that's not really willing to take on payroll um, may be willing to swap that pick for the 31 for almost nothing. I think that's a pretty, there's a decent possibility that could happen. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you hit the nail right on the head with that. Uh, before we get off the uh, Bobcats, uh, one guy I want to ask you about who I thought was a pretty good player coming out of college, and I thought he'd be okay in the NBA, but it just hasn't worked out so far, is uh, DJ Augustine. Uh, is he still part of their future plans, you think? I don't think so. Um, we'll find out for sure this summer. Is uh, his rookie deals up. He's going to be a restricted free agent. Um, they they had some conversations earlier in the season about a, a long term deal. Uh, it, they kind of called those off. I think I don't know that he's going to be a, a point guard, starting point guard in this league. Mm-hmm. Um, it appears to me he's kind of a lower tier. You know, if you're ranking the point guards in the league, he's in probably the bottom third. I think, in my opinion. Um, and, and drafting Kimball Walker last year, uh, you know, he's going to be on a rookie deal three more years. He's going to be a lot cheaper than Augustine's going to be. Right. Uh, I don't think the, I don't think the drop off is that big. So I would be surprised. He, I think in, there might be a likelihood that he's back one year. I know the Bobcats will extend the qualifying offer on him. Um, if he doesn't get a great deal somewhere else, he might sign that offer play one year and become unrestricted free agent next year. But if he gets a good offer in free agency, I doubt the broadcast would be inclined to match it. Is there any, uh, what's the maybe best, uh, I'm not looking for a specific name, but just kind of a general name of 
what's the best type of free agent you could see them landing uh, in the off season? This summer, I don't think that I don't think the Rock are going to be buyers. Um, this uh, this rebuilding process is going to take a few years, and uh, there's at least one more year of, of bad basketball left in Charlotte. I'm afraid uh, they they still have three really bad contracts um, that that will all be expiring next summer. Um, at Corey McGetty, Pat Carroll, and Donna Job, they're all over combined with I think 22, 23 million next year. Um, so we're not going to be that far under the cap this year unless we choose to amnesty someone. So I think the plan is going to be patient, get two players in this draft, and we'll probably be able to get two guys who can play for us right away, um, and then wait till next summer because they, they can have the ability to have, you know, 35 million or so under the cap in 2013. And my guess is they'll get the two guys this draft. They're probably going to get high in the lottery again next year and have lots of money to spend. So I, I don't think that they're going to strike this summer. Uh, any move they make will be uh, probably for guys, you know, try to find some more players on, you know, for the mid level or less. Well, Brian, definitely a fun catching up with you. We will can. Continue to check out your uh, your writings, and we'll read at the blog at tradestreetpost.com, and we look forward to doing this again much more in the future. I appreciate it, Bob.